Agency TV 18. Well, let me begin by first uh, thanking ISPP, Indian School for Public Policy, for in fact having us here and for giving us this opportunity of connecting with not just the scholars, but also uh, the Honorable Minister himself, Mr. Rajiv Chandrasekhar. Uh, and on that note, Mr. Chandrasekhar, I'd like to thank you as well for uh, taking, giving us this time for connecting with us once again. Just last week, uh, we met when we were talking about uh, uh, the amended IT rules that's generated a fair bit of debate. And speaking of debate, uh, we're sitting in a room of, full of scholars, uh, scholars of public policy uh, and Speaking of public policy, we are at an inflection point. We are seeing a lot of new technologies and we're trying to see the law grapple with those technologies in terms of developing a regulatory framework. Uh, so an exciting uh, few months ahead as far as public policy is concerned and not just a few months. Uh, like the minister said in his keynote address, this is an ever-evolving exercise uh, with the law trying to keep pace uh, with the technology. So an exciting times. Uh, but speaking of exciting times, uh, one key message, Mr. Chandrasekhar, uh, that the government is trying to put out is that we're looking at uh, not just an open free internet uh, but also accountability now the concern here is that very often we get feedback from the big tech players uh, that this may perhaps dampen spirits uh, may cause uh, innovation to get dampened may cause uh, growth to get hurt now this i'm using in reference uh, to, of course, uh, uh, feedback that we're getting from a lot of industry bodies saying that over-regulation could be a problem, uh, that ensuring accountability could, in fact, cause hurt to innovation. Your quick thoughts on that. Uh, we are where we are as a world today uh, because for many, many years and decades, governments of the world were led to believe that these are only innovations and this is only about technology innovation. Unfortunately, the, the opposite is true, that these platforms have, uh, whether they are uh, fintech platforms or e-commerce or social media, they have tremendous influence to do good as well as do harm. Now, when you have the ability to do harm, it is the moral uh, obligation of every government to protect citizens from the harm. Now, if somebody laid out a case for me that all the platforms did was only good, Frankly, I would be spending a lot of, a lot of my time doing other things. So the, but the empirical evidence is there. The evidence is there that there is considerable harm uh, that is being uh, created on the internet. Uh, the, you know, the less vulnerable sections of our society are uh, uh, clearly, uh, you know, when I mean less vulnerable, I mean people who are less digitally savvy find it very difficult today to, uh, uh, in many, many cases, to to traverse the internet. Interesting. Um, I'll just like to build on the next question using an example. Uh, now, last last week, we had uh, uh, a satellite launch at ISRO, which was one of the largest launches we've seen, uh, commercial launches uh, from India. And at the time, I was there with a colleague. I recorded a video of the rocket launch. It's, it's once in a lifetime one experience. Web, yes. 36 OneWeb uh, satellites. Uh, interestingly, when I put that up on Twitter, I was asked uh, to take that down. And there was a 12-hour suspension notice that I was given. By Twitter. By Twitter. So these are, and I, I realized I wasn't the only one. These are, these are common shared experiences between very many people. Uh, the question that I'm building towards is the concept of the GAC, or the Grievance Appellate Committee, that has now been introduced uh, by way of IT rules. You said uh, just last week uh, that you personally are in receipt of thousands, if not lakhs, of complaints. Uh, what was the reason felt for a GAC, for an appellate committee, uh, because the understanding was we already have grievance officers, or is that mechanism simply not working for us? No, there are two reasons for it. One is that the grievance officers that we mandated in May 2, 2021, that the platforms appoint weren't doing their job. Uh, and I said this, I've said this repeatedly, that uh, there was probably a miscommunication or a deliberate attempt not to understand the government's intentions. When we said platforms should appoint a grievance officer, it was assumed that it would be obvious that the grievance officer would address grievances. But if you appoint a grievance officer and then bounce all the grievances back uh, that are received as email, saying thank you for sending your grievance and we will revert to you when we have to revert to you, then you're not doing your job. The second, I want to make clear to you that one of the issues that the IT rule takes care of by making sure that we mention Article 14, 19, and 21 as non-negotiable constitutional rights of our citizens that cannot be violated is to prevent the precise arbitrariness of platforms that you mentioned. We cannot allow platforms to say 
we do not recognize Article 19 as a fundamental right in India, and we will take Ashmit down when I, we, we don't like him, and we will keep somebody else on when we like him. Uh, well, the GAC, uh, as you pointed out last time, uh, if you would remember just immediately after the announcement in the press conference, a lot of questions that were invited were on the lines of uh, GAC, is this the stick that will make uh, the companies, the social media companies fall in line uh, or is there more work required? Look, uh, first of all, I want to say our government doesn't believe in sticks, but we surely believe in spelling out what our combined joint goals are. and. Once we spell it out once, twice, thrice, and I have said this repeatedly, the relationship between the government and a platform is not adversarial. We want to work in partnership to create the end outcome, which is a joint mission for us, which is safe and trusted internet. We want that. But if a platform decides, chooses, that I don't want to do this, we are not taking a stick to them. We are only saying, fine, that is your, your choice. But the safe harbor you have under Section 79 of the IT Act falls. You are, you are welcome to continue to do your business. But the moment you do harm to a consumer, or you are party to harm to a consumer, then the consumer will be able to sue you, and we will not stand and protect you as an intermediary with Section 79 uh, protection. That's all we are saying. So all of this elaborate narrative, Ashmit, before you get to the next question about that, I'll preempt that which is that whether we intend to content moderate, we intend to do nothing <laughs> of the sort. Uh, the government is far too busy building a digital economy of a trillion dollars. We have a lot of work on our plate. And I can assure you, it is not a great pastime on my part to figure out what mistakes A, a platform is making or B platform. We would like them to self-regulate. We would like them to understand the principles and uh, the objectives that we have, because it is a win-win for them, for the digital nagrik, and for the government. If they get it, they get it. If they don't get it and they, uh, they choose to, non uh, to not comply with the rules, then the consequences are as I've laid down under Rule 7. I think the Honorable Minister is only too wise to our ways. He's anticipated the question, uh, which is essentially what I had in mind uh, with respect to how there were some concerns expressed uh, about uh, government control. But you've answered that. But uh, let me then amend the question. Yes, sir. Uh, when you're talking about an appellate forum such as uh, the GAC, where the GAC will then sit and appeal from uh, uh, decisions that are taken by uh, the social media intermediaries, uh, that will again require a very large framework in terms of uh, number of benches, who will uh, be no, manning so them. We will have, uh, Ashwin, we will make it very simple. We will make it very digital. It is a question of uh, a grievance being lodged there that seeks an appellate uh, uh, you know, resolution. And behind the digital platform, there will be multiple benches of 333 people, two outsiders and one government nominee. And it will all be done very online. It will not require lawyers. It will not require. The whole idea of the GSE is, is to create an easier method to adjudicate the dispute between a platform and a citizen, which, by the way, the citizen has and the platform has the process of law. They can always go to court. We are only saying, look, that is a complicated process. It's an expensive process. Let's make it easier for both of you. If you have a dispute that you cannot resolve, go to a group of three people, do it digitally, you file it digitally, and get the response digitally. Sure. Uh, speaking of social media intermediaries, we're seeing a lot of development, a lot of work being done uh, on the regulatory side as well as the companies themselves on the innovation side. I'm harking to the issue of what we are seeing in the US with respect to Twitter. A lot of changes being contemplated there. Uh, that's one platform that's used by very many users. Uh, and what's interesting is that something, or what's happening there, like for instance, charging $8 for a verified account is now beginning to attract the attention of uh, heads of states as well. We had uh, the Turkish president, Erdogan, comment about it, saying that uh, he might have to use diplomacy with Elon Musk. Uh, just your take. This is something interesting we're seeing. We don't have answers to this. Look, I am not the Turkish president, and I don't uh, want to have any diplomatic conversation with Elon Musk. Uh, our views are that our expectations of our ev every platform uh, remains intact, regardless of who's the owner. We will not intervene in the business models of these platforms. Uh, you know, there is a case where Spotify, for example, gives you free music and has a premium product where they give you priced music. So if that is the direction in which Elon Musk wants to take Twitter in, how can we sit down here and say this is the business model that is working in India or not? 
That is his choice. If he wants to make Twitter uh, less relevant in India, have a smaller audience, that is his cho choice. So I don't think, and from what my limited understanding, it's not like he's on my speed dial or I know him well or any of that. Uh, I don't think he's saying that people will not have, have access, free access to internet. He's only saying that the verified access will be a blue tick access for which he will charge a premium. Uh, that's how I understand it so far. I don't know the fine print, and uh, Elon Musk is a man. I understand we must read the fine print before we uh, jump to any conclusion. Uh, so, uh, but it, that doesn't bother me, and I don't want to get into the race of being, you know, the sound bites on his uh, his tweet, and I'll retweet, and then somebody else will tweet. I don't I don't think our government is into that. Um, at the end of the day, it's his uh, it's his platform. He is a shareholder, and uh, our expectations from the platform of con conforming to our rules, conforming to our laws, not violating our constitutional rights of our citizens, moderating the content. And if he can contribute in some way to our goal of making the internet a less toxic place and a more trusted place, because our goal is that our 120 crore Indians must enjoy the benefit and the privilege of having the internet being less toxic and more trusted. If he can contribute to that, I'd be happy to work with him. If not, uh, he's just one more intermediary that I have to deal with <laughs> under the laws and the rules. Uh, I'll go back again to last week. Uh, and last week, uh, you shared a very interesting uh, White House press release, uh, which highlighted a number of concerns. White House had invited various, uh, very many experts in the field of technology and had sought advice on uh, what are the concerns that would uh, that are emerging right now. So we had concerns on competition law violations, privacy, uh, talking about uh, uh, predatory practices, etc. One of the concerns uh, that was red flag uh, was algorithmic discrimination. Uh, this is something, the algorithmic playbook of the companies is something that no one else is privy to except the companies themselves. Yet we find ourselves at a place in our lives where every decision from uh, the choice of the food article you want to order from an application uh, to even your life partner Correct. could in very large part be determined by these algorithms, is that perhaps the next leg of regulation that is now required? No, no, 100%. I think in the concept of user harm, uh, both uh, bots, which are anonymous, uh, machine learning driven identities online, backed by algorithms, both these constitute a real clear and present danger for our objective of safety and trust. Because if it's a bot and the bot is spewing out things and we want to live in a trusted internet, we don't know whether it's a real person or it's a bot that's putting out the stuff. The algorithmic accountability issue, which I raised in 2018 in Parliament when I was an MP, is a very, very important issue because, uh, you know, I'm a techie and I'm sure there are some people here who understand technology deeply. Algorithms are not some magic wand. They are coded by people. And algorithms essentially then reflect the biases of the person who codes the algorithm. And then that becomes the norm for the whole engine that is the social media engine. So algorithms only automate predetermined, pre-existing biases. Uh, it is not like algorithms are some human intelligence that discriminate right and wrong in a manner that a human cannot. Uh, I want to be very clear that algorithms are essentially machine-coded versions of a particular person's bias or a particular person's inferences. So uh, it is very dangerous when, and recently there was a case where there was a, uh, a Chinese government plant in a company that was, and he was in, in some sense responsible for coding the algorithms. And those algorithms were basically affecting consumers all around the world. So it is, a, it, is a, it is an issue that we understand very well. It is an issue that we consider in a bucket of user harms. It is an issue that the forthcoming Digital India Act, which is going to be a very contemporary, modern uh, framework for uh, our digital economy's growth for the next 10 years, that will certainly take that into account. Sure, Mr. Chandrasekhar. Uh, an exciting time, this, that we're looking at. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, on that note, let's slip into a very short break. We'll be back in just a few moments and continue this conversation uh, with uh, Mr. Chandrasekhar, as well as a room full of scholars on the other side. 
Hello and welcome back to this special broadcast right here on CNBC TV 18. We are being here hosted by the ISPP Indian School for Public Policy and with me uh, is the Minister of State for Ministry of Electronics and IT, Mr. Rajiv Chandra Shekhar. We are in conversation uh, on uh, the public policy challenges uh, that lie ahead. Uh, another aspect as far as uh, ensuring accountability has uh, in sync with the broader theme uh, has been about uh, privacy and privacy as you pointed out you were one of the petitioners uh, in the Puttaswamy case the Supreme Court upheld it to be a fundamental right and since then we've seen a lot of uh, policy work being done to build a framework for that uh, very recently we had had the bill withdrawn from the Parliament uh, at the time you had said that there needs to be more work need, needs to be put in uh, can you give uh, for the benefit of uh, no, no, people I here, what is the kind of work that needs to be done to yeah. make it more startup friendly, innovation friendly? No, so first of all, I think uh, I, I think most of you are aware of privacy being a fundamental right. And uh, if those of you who studied the original bill that was then repealed or withdrawn, will find that it had become very complicated. It had become very complex. It had become more than privacy. So a lot of the shortcomings in the IT Act were loaded onto the privacy bill including so regulating social media intermediaries and so on and so forth, including regulating devices uh, for trusted devices. That was also in the PDP. It was felt that what we need is something that works, something that is simple, something that is uh, that can be evolved as we go along and find more challenges. So that bill was repealed. It was a very complex bill. It, it created compliance burdens of a kind that uh, a uh, 28 year old who was starting a startup in uh, hyderabad or bangalore who, who, you know start, you know buckets of sweat so we withdrew it what we have coming and i can assure you that it will be very soon uh, that it will be opened up for public consultation where i would welcome uh, students like you to take a deep look at it comment on it uh, participate in that consultation uh, will be a much more uh, contemporary much more modern uh, much more simple bill for the stakeholders to understand. The citizens will understand it better. You will not need a law degree parallel to your uh, life to understand the law, which I think the previous bill required you to have not just a BA, LLB, but an, what is what was next after LLB, LLM. I think. <laughs> yeah, so that is all not going to be necessary. Very simple to read, very simple to understand, but at the same time, protecting the citizens' right to privacy as well as managing the innovation ecosystem to continue to be growing and uh, uh, thriving and you know the binary that you had to make it difficult for the citizens to make it easy for startups or you had to make it difficult for the startups to make it easy for the citizens that binary we will shatter with this bill sure uh, we're nearing the end i think of the 20 minute slot that we were given uh, just a couple more questions um, as far as a lot of these tech companies are concerned very recently we've seen uh, a lot of bulk hiring that, they, that are being done by these companies, uh, which stands testament to some the strength that some of these companies have, especially right. some of the Indian players. Right. Uh, the question I then want to ask is that at a time when we we've just come out of uh, work from home mechanisms, we have hybrid mechanisms, uh, there are questions that are now being asked on having a more flexible regime in terms of uh, uh, handling talent. I'm speaking of moonlighting. Uh, an employee of company A, uh, also contractually uh, working for a company B, a different company. Uh, is this perhaps a modern reality that we need to wake up to? So um, in my view on this is fairly clear and at the same time uh, is, uh, it can be, can be seen as a little hazy. First of all, I, I say that if, you have, if you're an employee today and you have a contract with a company, uh, there is nothing today, whether it's work from home or change circumstances that allow you to or justify your breaching that contract. Mm -hmm. And if the contract says, thou shall work only for me, thou shall work only for him. That's uh, the, the nature of a contract in, in India. So I don't want to encourage the conversation that seeks to say contracts are meaningless and therefore breaching of a contract can be justified by uh, this new post-COVID reality, et cetera, et cetera. However, I do believe that the world of the workplace going forward is going to go through deep tectonics changes. And the workplace as we see today is not the workplace of even two years from down the road. The workplace that we see in 2022 is clearly not the workplace that we saw in 2019 January or 2020 January for, for that matter. So remote working, flexible working, employee entrepreneurship, these are all trends that nobody should try and defeat or 
uh, uh, attenuate or break. These are there. These are there's tremendous tailwind behind these these trends. And so companies will have to re-engineer, restructure, rebuild their uh, workforce models going forward. But I uh, make it very clear every time I'm asked this question, there is no way I am going to condone somebody breaching their contract uh, and saying that I did it because the world has changed around me. That's not uh, that's not a uh, defense. If you if you if you're that keen on a new model, resign from the company and go out and do your thing. Um, and, and, and but I, I completely do subscribe to the belief that the workforces have permanently changed. Workplaces, architecture, and design has permanently changed. Well, uh, we are sitting in a company of like very eager years. I was told uh, there are students who want to share uh, some thoughts and maybe sure. some questions sure, sure. Uh, with the honourable minister. In fact, I think we have one question. Uh, if you'd like to share. My name is Siksha Daya. I am a law professional and a policy scholar here, public policy scholar here. So just a follow-up question of what Ashmit has already asked on GAC. So since uh, when we have GAC in place, and we also have a right of a user to go and appeal to a court, so don't you think there's going to be a conflict? There could be a conflicting decision on the same issue, number one. Uh -huh. Number two, will that not undermine the credibility of GAC? So the f on the first one, uh Look, we are letting the consumer or the platform decide where they want to go on appeal. You can't do both. Obviously, if you, if you are in the GAC and you go file a parallel appeal to the High Court, one of the parties will say, but you are already in this forum. You can't forum shop. Forum shopping is not allowed even if you, even in normal scheme of things, you're a, a law student. If I go to a tribunal, I can't go to the court at the same time. So, this is GAC ka structure. So authoritative literature and both our experience of the economy tells us that there is a huge gap now between education and training on one hand and employment on the other. So I wanted to ask what's the government of India's plan in trying to bridge this really wide gap between education and training and employment? One of the, uh, one of the I want to just bust a fallacy that skilling hasn't worked because over the last six years since uh, Prime Minister launched Skill India, over 32 million, 3.2 crore in Indian youth have been skilled. Uh, our research shows that of the 3.2 crore Indians, between 40 to 48 percent people have found some sort of self-employment or jobs. The areas that are growing in the workforce are digital, digital-led, electronics, IT, software, for which skills can't be overnight created. So if you see what we are doing, and you will see in November of this year, uh, we will be launching a new Skill India new mission. It is addressing a lot of high-end skills. It is addressing uh, skill delivery, not just limited by the Skill India network, but we are creating skill hubs where even universities and colleges will start encouraging the students to do certification programs even when they're doing a degree. On that note, I'd like to close this conversation. It's been another fruitful, engaging conversation uh, that I've had with the minister. I'm sure the uh, students and the scholars here have surely uh, benefited from that as well. So thank you once thank again you. for taking our time and thank sharing you. it with us. Thank you. Thank you.